Welcome to week 11, Seeing and Visualizing. The purpose of this lecture is to explore an example hybrid theory in cognitive science. A hybrid theory includes elements of all three approaches to cognitive science, classical, connectionist, and embodied. The particular hybrid theory of interest in this lecture is Zen and Polisham's recent theory of seeing and visualizing. We will begin by considering how some classical theories of language are beginning to include elements of embodied cognitive science. They situate the symbolic. We will then detail the properties of classical theories of visual perception, focusing in particular on the problem of underdetermination and on Treisman's feature integration theory. This will set the stage for our discussion of Polition's theory. The hybrid nature of this theory is an interesting reaction to classical models of seeing and visualizing. Classical cognitive science has launched a counter reaction against embodied cognitive science. It claims that embodied cognitive science is simply reintroducing behaviorism. Consider Polition's position. Some ideas are merely the perennial recycling of behaviorist ideology in psychology, which attempts to empty the organism of thought and replace it with increasingly complex reflexes. Ironically, many classical scholars turn to embodied ideas in order to generate workable theories. For example, take Ray Jackendoff, a leading linguist. He is steeped in the classical tradition. He was trained by Noam Chomsky. But Jackendoff's theories require situation. He proposes strong links between the structure of linguistic representations and the structure of representations from other modalities. Consider his cognitive constraint. There must be levels of mental representation at which the information conveyed by language is compatible with information from other peripheral systems such as vision, nonverbal audition, smell, kinesthesia, and so forth. In his book, Semantics and Cognition, Jackendoff even abandons logicism. He argues that semantics does not involve assigning truth values to logical or linguistic expressions. A new generation of researchers takes Jackendoff's cognitive constraint very seriously. MIT's Deb Roy builds robots that learn language. His machines link phonetic features from recorded speech to information derived from their vision and their action. Their semantics requires situation and embodiment. This is evident when we see a video of one of his robots, Ripley, learning language concepts. Ripley, hand me the red one. Ripley, hand me the blue one. Which blue one? The left one. Ripley, hand me the heavy one.
To set the stage for Politian's hybrid theory, let us first consider classical theories of perception. According to classical theories, perception is used to provide information for constructing useful models or representations of the real world. Perception provides sense data for modeling, thinking, and planning inside the classical sandwich. One common theory about perception is that it is purely bottom-up or data-driven. This means that perceptual processes detect visual features and then combine these features into feature combinations or conjunctions that define objects. A famous version of this type of theory is Selfridge's pandemonium model of letter recognition. Interestingly, a model that is connectionist in nature. The problem with a purely data-driven perceptual system is that the visual information detected by the eye, the proximal stimulus, is not sufficient to uniquely specify the properties in the world that caused it. That is, one proximal stimulus is consistent with many different interpretations, only one of which is correct. Consider the Necker cube. If we watch it long enough, we will see that this proximal stimulus is ambiguous. It supports two very different three-dimensional interpretations. This situation is generally called the poverty of the stimulus or the problem of underdetermination. The Ames chair is another example of the problem of underdetermination. From one perspective, the proximal stimulus gives rise to the perception of a normal chair. However, the physical arrangement that actually causes the proximal stimulus is an arrangement of disjoint parts that are not very chair-like. Clearly, the proximal stimulus is consistent with two very different models of the world. Classical cognitive science has a standard solution to the problem of underdetermination. It assumes that perception is a form of cognition, a form of reasoning. We use our beliefs and expectations to provide information that is missing from the proximal stimulus. The information that we provide is sufficient to generate a unique interpretation of the visual world. Psychologist Richard Gregory argues that perception becomes a matter of suggesting and testing hypotheses. Seeing is believing. This classical view of perception is called top-down processing or theory-driven processing. To illustrate it, imagine that I have a proximal stimulus that delivers features like small, black and white, four legs, furry, two eyes, and nose. I use knowledge about where I am to create a sense of what I'm seeing. If I am in my house, I expect to see my cat Phoebe, and this is my interpretation of the proximal stimulus. If I am in the ravine, I do not expect to see my indoor cat, but would not be surprised to see a skunk. A change in expectations results in a changed interpretation of the same proximal stimulus. A pure top-down theory has problems too. If we only see what we expect to see, then we will not see surprises. Unfortunately, it is the surprises in the world that kill us. I don't expect to see a tiger running around in Mill Creek Ravine. However, I hope that in spite of this, if I did happen to encounter one, escape from the zoo perhaps, my visual system would be able to see it and uh, enable me to avoid being eaten by it. P 
pure data-driven and pure theory-driven models of perception have problems. So, many modern theories are compromises that incorporate both. A modern theory would include data-driven modules that detect various features, low-level vision. A modern theory would also include theory-driven processes that link knowledge of the world to visual information so that we can classify objects and know what they can be used for, high-level vision. A modern theory would also have a middle process called visual cognition that acts as a go-between. That is, high-level vision can request visual cognition to invoke attentional processes called visual routines that return particular information, for instance, by computing the relationship between two objects, is one to the left of the other, for example. An important example of a modern yet classical theory of visual processing is Anne Treisman's feature integration theory. According to this theory, vision begins when low-level processes separate stimuli into their component features. These features are represented as locations of activity on different feature maps. When required, a middle level of visual cognition can direct a spotlight of attention to a specific location in a master map. The attentional spotlight can glue together all of the features that are present at that location, features represented at that location in different feature maps. The feature conjunctions created by visual cognition can then be linked to object descriptions called object files that can be processed by higher level uh, reasoning. An important source of evidence for feature integration theory comes from experiments on visual search. A subject is presented a display in which there are a number of different objects. In such a display, there may be an odd man out, an object that is different from all of the other distractors. For instance, on this display, there's a red circle that's the only red circle in the entire display. The task is to search through a display as quickly as possible to see if there's an odd man out target. The time required to determine if such a target is present is the dependent measure. Independent measures include how many distractor objects are present, as well as the nature of the objects. Complex objects are defined as combinations or conjunctions of simple features. The two objects shown here, a connected object and a disconnected object are made from exactly the same features, but they differ in how these features are combined together. The following demonstration will give you the sense that it takes time to find complex objects in a visual search task. In contrast, simple objects defined only by the presence of a unique feature, like a unique color, or a unique orientation seem to pop out immediately from the display. The differences between searching for feature conjunctions and searching for simple features are explained by feature integration theory.
There are many different kinds of evidence that have been used to develop and support feature integration theory. For the purpose of this class, let us only consider this theory in the context of visual search. Feature integration theory can be used to explain why some targets pop out while others do not. First, how does feature integration theory explain pop-out? If a target pops out, then it is the only source of activity in a low-level feature map. So, if there is only one active location in one of these maps, then the unique target can be detected without invoking any processes higher up in the model. For instance, if the target is the only red object in a display, it will be the only source of activity in the red color map. It can be detected immediately without serial search from one location to another. The time to find it will not be related to the total number of distractors in the display. Feature integration theory has to deal with complex objects in a different way. These objects, by definition, are combinations of features. So, a unique complex object can only be found by using attention. The spotlight of attention is moved to one location in the master map. It is then used to glue together any features that are present in separate feature maps at that location. Only after the features are combined by attention can the properties of the object be analyzed. So, to find a complex odd man out, the attentional spotlight is directed to one location for processing. Then, it is directed to another location to process the features there. Then, it is directed to another location. This search from one location to another is called serial search. The greater the number of distractors, the greater the number of locations to search. This is why, for complex objects, reaction time increases with the number of distractors as shown in the graph on the slide. Neuroscientists have found that there are independent pathways responsible for detecting simple features in early visual processing. It is these features and only these features that will produce pop-out. Treisman feels that one of her main contributions was proposing this sort of model before neuroscientists came up with it, as can be seen in the short video that follows. I suppose I'm best known for um, trying to understand how attention shapes the world of perception, what we see, what we um, become consciously aware of and what things we don't become aware of but still the brain registers. Uh, so I'm interested in how consciousness is created from the sensory data that reach our eyes and ears. I suppose the thing that was most fun was that I came up um, before the neuroscientists discovered the fact that the brain seems to be fairly specialized for different um, processes in different areas. Um, I came up with, with that notion um, separately and uh, asked the question how we put those different aspects together again to form the kind of integrated world that we experience. Uh, so how do we see that uh, the skirt is red and the blouse is blue, for example, rather than the other way around? Um, well, for me it's always been fun, you know, so the excitement of the new ideas. So let your imagination go and uh, check it out if you can, you know, think of ways of bringing it down to earth so that you can actually test it. 
and uh, that's what my students have been doing and in fact succeeding at mainly. Polition's theory of seeing and visualizing departs from feature integration theory in some radical ways. He replaces the single attentional spotlight with multiple attentional tags called fints. These tags pick out objects and stick to objects, but do not deliver object features. In Polition's theory, we detect objects before we detect object properties. Finst stands for finger instantiation. It is an attentional tag that sticks to an external object just as if we were following that object by placing a finger on it but not looking at the object at the same time. Finsts track objects without delivering visual features. When we need featural information, we use a fence to access an object for inspection. The original experimental support for fences came from multiple object tracking experiments. Subjects fixate on the center of a display filled with identical objects. Some of the objects blink, identifying them as targets and attracting fences to them. The blinking stops and the objects begin to move independently and randomly. The task is to track the moving targets with the mind, not the eye. After a period of time, movement stops and an object is highlighted. The task is to say whether the object was a tracked target or not. Subjects can track four or five of these objects accurately and simultaneously. Supporting the notion of fences and causing problems for theories that appeal to an attentional spotlight. The following short video demonstrates the general paradigm. 